All right. Once again, welcome to our program this morning from the Camden Garden Club's Winter Horticulture Series. I am going to turn the program now over to our representative from the Camden Garden Club, Deborah Stokes. Deborah, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, well, thank you, Julia. And good morning, everyone. And welcome to the third presentation in the Camden Garden Club's annual Winter Horticultural Series. And just a reminder, on next week's program, it will be presented by representatives of the Native Gardens of Blue Hill, and they will cover the use of native plants in the garden and how they function in the ecosystem. And just in case by now you're not familiar with the Camden Garden Club, we are a nonprofit organization in support of the town of Camden since 1915. Our activities include putting up and maintaining the hanging baskets of geraniums from the downtown lamppost in the summer, the Christmas trees that hang during the holiday season, and the flowers at the arch, the Main Street Bridge, and the traffic islands. Another important effort is providing scholarships to local graduates who plan to obtain a degree in one of the natural sciences. The club is also a partner in the Camden's Shade Tree Program. Now these activities are supported by our annual garden tour held the third Thursday in July, and we hope to see you there. You can find more information and how you can help the garden club at camdengardenclub.org. So now it is my pleasure to introduce today's topic and speaker, which is a real nice tie-in with last week's discussion on garden plant diseases. So I know many of us are looking for proper approach when diagnosing plant pest problems. What are environmentally sound treatments for them? Can we use cultivation practices and timing of planting as ways to minimize pesticide usage? Well, John Petrowski is the manager of pesticide programs, a master gardener pesticide educator, and manager of the pesticide programs at the Maine Board of Pesticide Control in Augusta. Now, John is a local boy. He grew up in Rockland, and he spent a lot of his time in Camden skiing the snowball, swimming at the YMCA, and hiking the surrounding areas. Now, he's recently moved to Liberty and has hiked the Camden Hills from one side to the other this winter. And he told me there is no better place to be. So without further ado, I turn the program over to John. Thank you both very much, Julia and Deborah. So thank you. Let me see if I can share my screen one more time. We see that okay? Yes, it looks great. Thank you, John. Thank you. So I do want to thank you all very, very much for showing up today uh, to listen to my talk. I do want to stress, uh, I welcome all questions and comments, both uh, positive and negative. So please, uh, please reach out to me. Um, a couple things I do want to stress is, uh, you know, pesticides are uh, are very emotional topics. So a lot of people have a lot of different opinions on them. So don't be afraid to share them with me. So again, I'm John Petrosky with the Board of Pesticide Control. And this is our uh, homepage, our website, and it is Think First, Spray Last. So you're gonna hear me say that a lot today about thinking first before you spray. But this is our web page. Uh, there is a lot of resources there for if you're you to use. Uh, please use us as a resource. If there's something there you, that you do not see, don't ever be afraid to call us. Uh, we have a lot of people on staff. We have a toxicologist. If you have questions about uh, a certain active ingredient or a certain chemical that you're concerned about getting into the environment or what it's gonna do to your health, don't be afraid to reach out for us as well. But also when it comes to pests, uh, we have a lot of links and a lot of people here that can try to help you. So you will also find many handouts on our uh, on throughout our, our web page. So again, from the Master Gardener programs that we've done, but also to many different links uh, that can help you as gardeners. And we have a large, large selection of them. So today's talk, um, I got a lot of different things I'm going to try to hit up on, uh, but primarily it is, um, I want to, the first thing I want to do really is to give you an, a review on what pests are and maybe what pesticides are. So years ago, 
this is what we thought of ourselves when we were going to use pesticides. We get out there, we went to an ag store or a box store or something like that. Hardware store, we bought a whole bunch of different pesticides and we just went out there and our objective was to go out there and spray and kill. But pesticides now ha have a risk both to you and the environment. And pesticides should only be a tool in your toolbox. Uh, we've been fortunate in the state of Maine the last uh, few years that I can recall here is that we've had no real pesticide poisonings. Uh, we've had some strange things happen though. Uh, up in New Sweden at one time, somebody was putting arsenic in the tea for their fellow parishioners. But there was one, actually one serious pesticide poisoning that uh, I can recall. And that was actually somebody wanted to take care of their crows or that were uh, on their property. So they took some, a rodenticide, which is to kill rodents, and they wrapped it with bacon and they put it out in their fields to try to kill the crows. Unfortunately, a uh, neighbor always walked their dogs and the dogs went out there and ate those uh, bacon wrap rodenticides and actually both died right on the spot. So um, we have to be very, very careful uh, when we are actually using something, especially something in that particular case where it is against the label and not following uh, what you should be doing. So today I'm going to talk a lot about IPM and this is IPM, Integrated Pest Management. And uh, primarily, again, the first thing we always want to do is identify. We want to evaluate. We really want to prevent without using a chemical at this point. And then we may take different actions, and then we want to follow it up. But before we get to this point, um, I really want to discuss pest first. So, and this is got pest. So uh, many of you um, probably have seen this one on the left on many of your gardens. And that is of course the Japanese beetle and the grubs that are associated with that. And then there's a lily leaf beetle and, and riburnum leaf beetle, but many of these you've already seen. I really wanna make sure you look at uh, that Japanese beetle there right in the middle uh, with that big white dot on it. Cause I'm gonna come back, come back to that in a little while. So, but what is a pest? And many times a pest is actually what we think it is going to be. But today we're all dealing with COVID-19 and of course that's a virus and that is certainly a pest. And then we have bacteria. You have probably seen many fungus or fungi in growing in your gardens and plant diseases are associated with that. There are weeds, uh, this particular uh, weed, which I personally don't call it a weed. So as a beekeeper, I, these are my favorite plant. Uh, so when the bees are coming out here in the spring, they're really looking for food and they're pretty hungry. So these dandelions are to me are a huge benefit. Of course, we have insects and mites and those are aphids right there. But also vertebrates, uh, you know, the white-tailed deer, some people think white-tailed deer are a um, pest. Starlings and mice and skunks and squirrels. But it all, again, sometimes it's just what our pers perspective actually is, is what is a pest. I do have to put a little disclaimer here that before you take any lethal methods to try to kill those deer or starlings, stuff like that, please make sure you talk to the main warden service or your local bi wildlife biologist. But this is important. What is a pesticide? You know, and a pesticide is any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pests. So it's very, really important you know that. But it also can be any plant regulator, defoliant, or desiccant. Remember, it does not include uh, fertilizers or nutrients. It does not include beneficial organisms. And it does not include mechanical uh, traps or means and things like that. But I always want to stress, pesticides have risk. Today, pesticides are extremely common. So whether or not you go to a box store, or if you go to an ag store, or if you go to a hardware store, uh, even on your corner market, you're going to see all kinds of different pesticides today. And these are just an example right here, what you may or may not see in stores. But again, they are very, very common today in all stores. And remember that, I just want to stress, is that everything is a chemical or an element. And pesticides are in all shapes and sizes. So what is that pesticide again? 
it's all kinds of them and it brings up all kinds of different feelings from different people. So there are herbicides, things like maybe glyphosate, uh, insecticides that maybe we're using a, a bifenthrin or something like that to actually treat for mosquitoes or ticks. There are fungicides or denicides and the list goes on. So there are quite a different, um, different actually pesticides uh, uses under that big word of pesticide. And these are pesticides. So our disinfectants, the ones that we're using today to actually go in and maybe clean our counters or clean our doorknobs because we're very concerned about transmitting COVID-19. But again, if you bleach is a commonly used pesticide. And of course there are fungicides that we're using to clean mold and mildew and plant diseases, insecticides and herbicides. Those herbicides are again, are weed killers. And then we have rat and, moise, uh, and mouse and po uh, poison baits. But we also deer uh, rabbit repellents. They are a pesticide. The insect and tick repellents that we put on our clothing or on our skin, maybe not hopefully, but uh, that we are using to uh, repel mosquitoes. And then something that a lot of people don't realize, of course, is actually plant growth regulators are also a pesticide. This is from quite a few days ago, uh, but this was bug death. And uh, this is what you bought when you wanted a pesticide. And interestingly enough, on the particular label on the side of this box, which I didn't show, but it says the more you use, the better off you are. Of course, hopefully today that is not the case. So again, uh, something from the olden days right here, which is very common. Then there are natural, organic, and green pesticide uh, pesticides. Uh, they include the products that are derived from plants, bacteria, fungi, and minerals. And here are examples of them right there. I just want to. I'll stress one thing here. Maybe I will. Sorry about that. Botanical pesticides are organic pesticides that are derived from plants who typically use it as a form of protection. So it actually comes from a plant that is already using it as a protection. These botanical pesticides include chemicals such as nicotine and oils like citrus oils. Biological control is the use of natural enemies to reduce densities of insects, pests, and weeds. So what about using these type of products? Um, we don't really recommend them for a variety of reasons. Many of the materials that we seen that we think are safe because we eat them or use them on our skin and so on actually can uh, be very harmful to us because the exposure routes may be different. Uh, what we eat may not be safe for us to breathe, for example. And to give you an example of this, um, you know, uh, for example, it would be actually peppermint oil, which uh, probably nobody here likes Christmas peppermint cookies more than I do. However, if we actually breathe peppermint, oils or get them on their skin, they can actually hurt us. So the EPA has exempted some pesticides and those are actually called 25B products. And these are exempt from federal registration, but they must be registered in the state of Maine. So I just wanna stress that all pesticides that are used here in the state of Maine have to be registered here. Uh, for the regular pesticides that you see an EPA number on section three, uh, pesticides, they have to be registered with the EPA, uh, which is very, very important. But when we have these exempt pesticidal products, they are exempt from toxicity testing. Well, essentially what that means is uh, other pesticides that have been tested by the EPA, they're going to have a risk factor put on them, which we'll talk about in a little while here. But again, when you get 25B products and some of them are listed of the active ingredients like rosemary oil and peppermint oil, they are not um, tested by the EPA. And the other part of that is they are not tested for efficacy. So what does that mean? 
does it really work? So today, unfortunately, we do see a lot of people out there uh, saying they get 25B products and they may be using them to treat mosquitoes or maybe ticks. And they may be making claims that have not, cannot be backed up with actually research. So we have to be, you as the consumers have to be very careful about that. And I always want to stress, they are definitely, definitely not risk-free. And this is a skin, I got talked about that peppermint oil very quickly. Uh, and there are other ones, cinnamon oil is another one. They can actually, if they get in the right concentrations, they can actually hurt us and be harmful. And one other one that I, I will stress very quickly is that, uh, again, we don't recommend from at the Board of Pesticide Control home chemistry. Many of the materials that we use seem safe because we eat them, we use them on our skin, but the exposure route, how we use them uh, may be different. So one of them is eucalyptus oil. I have eucalyptus oil in my home, which we use. However, three milliliters, which is a pretty small amount, can actually cause a great deal of harm and even death. So we have to be very, very careful and do our homework before we actually use some of these natural products. Again, what products are not pesticides? Are nematodes, which are, can be very, very helpful if you use them, for example, to control grubs. Uh, you can get them online, get them at other stores. But again, they're a little challenging to use. You got to use them pretty quick before they die. They, um, if you get them, for example, you order them online, you want to make sure you use them correctly. Uh, they have to put in with water. But again, uh, you don't want to sit them in your car, let them get warm because they will die very quickly. Uh, again, mechanical traps, such as you see there, the mouse trap or the insect trap, like that one that people use on uh, for Japanese beetles, which we don't happen to recommend. Um, and then there are beneficial insects or mites, which can be very, very helpful in you trying to control the insects or pests that you have on your gardens and property. So what does actually registration mean? It is definitely not a safety guarantee. There's reasonable certainty of no harm, but they are not risk-free. If you get anything out of today's talk that I'm giving to you, please remember, these are chemicals and they can hurt you. They can hurt you, but they can also hurt the environment. If we follow the label though, if we follow that label, which is the law, it's a federal law, um, there's reasonable certainty of no harm, but they again are not risk-free. At the Board of Pesticide Control, one word that you will rarely ever hear us say is, is the word safe, because again, uh, these are chemicals and they're elements, and we want to be very careful about using them. So what are the benefits, uh, you know, about using pesticides? Is it the right thing to do? But again, this is also very controversial, depending on uh, your perspective, aesthetics. Do we really need that lawn that is absolutely perfect without any dandelions or any weeds, for example? And um, I'm certainly not trying to uh, uh, create a stir at all, but uh, again, we all have our different perspectives on what is truly the benefit. Uh, healthy, saleable plants and produce uh, is also very, very important to many of us. Excuse me. And I will give you a quick example When you go into your grocery store and, and uh, it's interesting to go into the vegetable and fruit section and actually watch people and how they actually decide, is this an acceptable uh, piece of fruit or piece or vegetable? I always enjoy watching people pick up green peppers and uh, sometimes people pick up 10 or 15 green peppers trying to find that perfect one. And I always wanna actually, I don't, my wife wouldn't let me, but if I would like to always go up there and say, well, you know, why are you picking this one up and putting this one down? I, I believe they all test the taste the same. And, you know, maybe that little blemish is on there, but I know that in the gardens that you have, you probably wouldn't be throwing those away if they had a little bit of a blemish and so on like that. So also uh, we want a bountiful harvest, um, which is also very important to us. But one of the most important things too, on when it comes to use of pesticides, is these public health pests. Uh, and I know that on the coast uh, and actually going more inland, now you've got the brown tail moth and maybe some of you are already experiencing how much uh, that can be a real pain, uh, the brown tail moth. And of course, mosquitoes, 
uh, transmit a lot of different diseases. We have deer ticks and bed bugs. And unfortunately, we're still dealing with COVID-19. What are the human risks? Acute. Uh, first, you could maybe get a rash, a nausea, eye ticks, or stomach cramps, or death. So again, this is if it just, you know, you may have come into contact once or twice, uh, you know, and got it on your skin, maybe got breathed it a little bit, unfortunately. But again, these would be something that if you got it, but there are some serious, serious chronic long-term problems, uh, including cancer, birth defects, and so on. So again, uh, these can actually cause some very, very serious issues if you don't use them correctly. But all pesticides have risk. Organic doesn't mean safe always. Uh, synthetic doesn't mean it's highly toxic. If you see the one to the right of the screen is celeprin, that's actually a synthetic, but it actually is uh, to the, it, the way it has been registered by the EPA. It doesn't even have a signal word, which we'll talk about here shortly. But again, natural doesn't mean safe. And I'm talking about things like uh, nicotine, uh, you know, neonicotoids. So some of these uh, uh, can be very, very uh, harmful. And then again, rotenin, uh, we don't, can't use that anymore because it has been associated with Parkinson's disease. So all of those, organic doesn't mean safe, synthetic, synthetic doesn't mean it's highly toxic, and natural, of course, doesn't mean it's safe to use. And all substances are poison. There is uh, none of which is not a poison. It's just the right dose and how much you take. When I was younger, uh, many, many years younger, they used to have contests where pe sat people in a room, they gave them like a gallon or more of water, they drank it, and the last person who had to go to the bathroom may have won concert tickers or something like that. But that l young lady on the bottom, she died by drinking way too much water because it uh, messed up her electrolytes. So again, even water can actually hurt us. So we have to be very, very careful. So how do we actually uh, tell how the acute risk. And there are three signal words. So when you do go in and you look at um, pesticides, they will have one of these words on it. Caution, warning, and danger. Uh, caution means it's slightly toxic. Warning means it's moderately toxic. And danger is highly toxic. For those who use those danger signal word products, they do have to have special licenses. Uh, you may be able to find some products that have warning, but most of the products that you would be able to buy are actually would just have the caution word on them. And risk, and this is very important. This is actually how the EPA decides how the risk is, and it's toxicity times exposure. So if you use one of those products that has the word danger on it, that is highly toxic, but your exposure is low, you use your PPE correctly, or you use this particular product very infrequently, that may have a lower risk than something that may have the caution word, but you use it on a regular basis and maybe you don't use your PPE. So again, risk is based on that toxicity, that product that you use, how long you use it, and are you taking care of yourself when you do it? So again, we wanna reduce our risk. We use PPE and the person in the center there is actually pretty well prepared. He has a hat on, he's got long sleeves, he has gloves, he's got those boots, and he's got that wand down low. So we don't want that particular wand way up high. Um, the label, which I haven't got into very much, the label will tell you what you need to wear if you're gonna use this particular product. Most products will tell you to use gloves, um, long sleeves, and long pants you are violating the law and it's a federal law if you don't wear those particular things, if it is written on the label and you could be subjected to fines. So I just always wanna stress, please, please make sure you always, always wear your PPE. And if it doesn't list certain things like glasses and so on, don't be, ever be afraid, please wear more than you actually need. And there are other pesticide risks, there's drift, where it goes on to uh, maybe your neighbor's property. There's water contamination where what it gets into the, our groundwater and also in our surface waters and it can have fish kills. Storage, as you can see to the bottom right, uh, that was uh, not uncommon, but many, many, many years ago today, doesn't you will not see this, I hope. And of course, disposal. What do you do with pesticides you don't use or have gone by, which 
Uh, we do have a lot of information for you on that, and I will be actually bringing that up shortly. But again, these are some very, very serious pesticide risks. Drift, again, can go onto somebody else's property, a go where it's not supposed to go. And we have to check for sensitive areas. So sensitive areas are, are uh, encompass a lot of things, but it includes people, it includes water, uh, where um, many things that you know could be a school, all these type of things are sensitive areas. And we've got to make sure that we stay away from them. We have to watch out for the wind speed. We can't use pesticides uh, under 15 miles per hour. The Board of Pesticide, of course, recommends is two to 10. But again, uh, it law is 15. But again, wind, and if uh, as you is growing up on the coast, uh, you know, 15 miles per hour is a pretty heavy wind. Keep your spray low. You saw that in the slide before where the guy had the wand down low. We don't want it way up in the air. Spray with the breeze. And don't apply when it's over 85 degrees. And the reason that particular is, is that actually pesticides will volatize and they'll get into smaller particles and then they will go up uh, and they can actually travel for miles. Uh, John, we had a question that just came in that has to do with drift. Uh, Anne asks, what can I safely use to control weeds in my long gravel driveway while not affecting the abutting gardens? That is a great question. So, uh, the, the biggest thing, the first thing is, is don't do something called a broadcast treatment, meaning that you, when you take your actual spray, and let's just say you're using a, a glyphosate or some other herbicide like that, you don't want to be holding it very up high. Uh, you want to be very careful. And then we want you to use, do something called spot treatments. For example, you may go up to that particular area that has a crabgrass, for example, and spray that particular that just that one section of crabgrass, do not spray your entire gravel driveway because that's broadcast. We don't want that. The next thing is that is very, very important. Did it rain last night? Did it rain this morning? Is there rain in the forecast for tonight? Uh, we got to, and we're working very hard today with people to really pay attention to water because, you know, um, glyphosate, for example, if you spray it on your crabgrass and air is sun, uh, it will break down really quickly. It will also attach itself to the organic material. So we do not see actually glyphosate in our water, in our groundwater or, or in our streams uh, compared to other products which do not do that, uh, will leach you know, very quickly. But to, to go back to the original question is do a spot treatment Definitely, you know, don't hold that wand more than 10 inches or 12 inches above where you're trying to spray. Only spray in that one area. And before I forget, give it time. So let's just say that you do use glyphosate and it's a systemic. It means it's got to go into that plant. It's got to go down into the roots and then it's going to come back up and kill it. So you want to give it two or three weeks actually. So before you'll see any... Um, before you'll see any real uh, action on that. However, there are other pesticides that when you go in there into a, in a store and you're gonna see kills in three hours. Well, that's a contact uh, pesticide. That's actually gonna go in and it will kill that particular top of that plant pretty quickly. What it doesn't do is it doesn't go down into the roots to kill the roots. So you can spray uh, a contact herbicide and it will kill the top of it. And it's very common to use actually uh, vinegar, which does work as a contact pesticide and it can work really well. Unfortunately, it's not killing the roots. And so that particular, um, that particular weed or pest can actually come back. So I hope Julia that, that answered that question. So, but I'll, I mean, more, give more detail if they do need that. Yes, thank you. Um, runoff. Uh, very, very, very important here. Really something that the Board of Pesticides today is truly stressing to all of our applicators, uh, both commercial and those also in farms, but also at, for homeowners. Uh, we're really looking at uh, what's going on when it comes to uh, pesticides in our water. And then more, more than two dozen pesticides have been detected in main groundwater. And I will tell you that this year, we're doing it right now, actually, and just finishing up, 
they are testing, uh, about, I think it's two to 300 wells uh, throughout the state of Maine um, for uh, pesticide residues in groundwater. And it will be eventually presented on our website so you can go to do that. But we do, uh, on a, but every other year we do testing for water. And so uh, it, it is very, very important that we do our pesticide correctly. So how do we keep it out of the water? Well, we locate and stay way away from our wells. We stay away from ledge. So if you have, for example, blueberry barrens or you know, wild blueberries, you know, they are notorious for growing on ledge. So we have to be very careful around them. We stay away from our wetlands and water. Do not apply to slopes near water. Do not apply before heavy rains or if rains are coming, we do spot applications. And then we can put in vegetation, vegetative buffers to actually stop the water if it's going down. Storage, please, please only buy what you need. If you see something that's, uh, you know, for a certain price at a quart, but you can buy five gallons for much, much cheaper, don't. Only buy what you need. Um, keep them out of the reach of children and lock them up. Keep in the original containers. Some of the worst pesticide accidents throughout the country have happened and unfortunately it happens far too often where people take the pesticides that they've got, they don't want that big container. They put it into unfortunately something like a soda bottle and uh, a child has drank. And uh, I can give you a few examples of where actually children have died uh, because of this. So this is where one of the big problems is. Uh, and again, never store in the basement. And the reason is they volatize. They will, cut, they will get uh, volatized into small particles and gases and they can actually float through your home. So you really, we don't want them to be anywhere in your house. Disposal, always follow the label, it's the law. You rinse your containers, you gotta rinse them actually three times. You take that rinse aid that you've used and you can apply it again to your labeled site. For example, if you were treating your lawn for uh, a weeds or something like that, you can go back and take that rinse aid and do it again. And then uh, the Board of Pesticide Control has an obsolete pesticide program. And I, hopefully all of you have heard of this. If you haven't, I'm gonna stress this forever today. Uh, so it started in the 1980s. Uh, we've collected over 20, 217,000 pounds to date. Uh, we do it every year. We do it at the end of summer, early fall. And these are the numbers that we have collected. We still collect DDT, we still collect old containers of pesticides, but it doesn't have to be old pesticides. If something that you bought, you decided not to use, or you used it, but you still have some left over and it's you know, and only a month or two old, we will take it off your hands for free. Uh, again, just go to, go, our, go to our website, look up the annual obsolete pesticide collection program and we have five different spots. One is in Augusta. There's another one in Portland. There's one in Bangor, Presque Isle. Uh, so you can actually bring your pesticides to us. We will take them off your hands. There are no questions asked. It is for homeowners and it is for farmers. And it is a great, great program. The pesticides are taken carefully. Uh, they are not going to get into the environment and do some damage. So really, I hope that you all take advantage of this. Again, a safe disposal, and there is no cost to you. So think first and spray last. Remember that quick fix that you want to do is neither, and make sure the benefits far, far outweigh the risk before you use a pesticide. So let's talk about IPM today. Uh, integrated pest management. And hopefully you've heard this and, uh, and some of your other speakers uh, maybe have brought this up as well. Monitor for pest and pest uh, conductive conditions. What does that really mean? You know, do you have a pest? So when I give exams to commercial master applicators, uh, I, the first question I ask them, you know, what, what do you really need to do? You go to a new site and you're looking to maybe make an application and look what you do. What is the first thing you're supposed to do? You know what? Is the pest even there? You know, um, so we have to be very, very careful. Is there a pest? Um, and then we can prevent pests. You know, we can use good sanitation, maintenance, and good horticultural practices. And you're going to hear me repeat this a lot today. So a lot of this 
I, I will continue to bring up. Determine your threshold. Is it really a pest? And I'll go back to my favorite plant, the dandelion, of course. And if you've got two or three dandelions in your lawn, and maybe, you know, maybe that's okay. Uh, maybe you don't want those dandelions. And maybe the best thing you can do is just actually mechanically remove them. Uh, but again, is it truly a pest for you? Um, and there are multiple pest control methods that eliminate pest access to food and water and shelter. And always, always, always keep records. So let's just say that you did use something last year in your gardens. Keep records. Did it work? How much did you use? So right now here getting ready for spring, you're pretty excited about getting ready to go out there and plant your gardens again and work on them. Go back and say, well, you know, that particular product that I used really didn't work. I, you know, didn't take care of the pest, or maybe it did. And where are you using it on what plants you used it on? So the elements of a good garden IPM is know your friends and enemies. I can't stress this enough to send samples to the University of Maine Pest Management Office or your local extension office for ID. They are truly the best. So you can do it a different, bunch of different ways. You can uh, trap it, you know, put it into a small glass uh, and send it to them, or you can put it in, you know, in a, a plastic bag and send it to them. You can take some, you can take some really good pictures. That will also help. Uh, go to the gotpest.org. And if you've never been there, please use that gotpest.org. It's really good about different pests. If you're trying to treat for a potato beetle, or if you're trying to even treat for the brown tail moth, it's got a lot of good sites there to help you. Um, and then avoid the pest. Use barriers such as row covers, fence, bird netting, and rotate crop families to New Year's. So it's very, very common people do use crop rotation, especially in, in big, bigger farms, whether it be potatoes or corn and so on. Again, uh, crop rotation is really helpful. So uh, one of the best resources that is out there to all of us is the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. I just put this in there. Your local cooperative extension uh, is in Waldeboro. They have got some extremely, extremely good people to work with, uh, especially when it comes to pest identification, but also a lot of different resources for you to use when it comes to dealing with pests. Some elements of garden IPM, use good horticultural practices. And uh, you've heard this over and over again select the right plants for the right places. Probably uh, if you know, if there's something that I do that's really wrong every year is when I go to a garden center and I'm, oh my God, look at that plant. It's exactly what I want. I love these colors. I love the size of it. What do I do? I spend a lot of money on it because I think it's the perfect plant for me. And then I'm putting it in the absolute spot, you know, whether it be in the sun or a poor soil, stuff like that. So again, always pick that right plant for the right place. Choose pest resistant, disease resistant cultivar, cultivars, cultivars, uh, provide plants with optimum plant nutrition, moisture and spacing, protect and encourage natural enemies, spare those pesticide sprays in the beginning. Please look for other alternatives as beneficial insects, which we can look at, diverse plantings, including season long offering of plants with flat open flowers to provide uh, nectar for our beneficial insects and pollinators. Look at the big picture, which is really, really important to you. On the right hand here, this is your property right here. You know, are you gonna to try to put something in there where there's poor drainage or I'll put a plant in that doesn't need full sun? Um, and again, you wanna look at your soils and look at that very carefully. And what are you planting and where are you gonna plant it? When I look at the bottom left here side and this, this was my garden, and I got a serious Japanese uh, beetle problem, you know, maybe I put those roses around there and do a trap plant, you know, so it actually brings them in. So in the Japanese beetle will go to the roses first because I can sacrifice those uh, and they will maybe we'll keep those away from my actual things that I'm really worried about, whether it be my peppers and eggplant and things like that. John, speaking of Japanese beetles, you had uh, earlier mentioned uh, about not using the Japanese beetle traps. Can you talk yes. about why you would recommend not using those? I am. Yeah. So hold on one second. I will be right there. Yes. <laughs> no problem. Okay. But that's a great question. So um, yeah, it is true. 
All right, so again, uh, again, look at the big picture. What are you really trying to do? This is now the perfect time for you. You get the time, a little bit here time before you're gonna go out there and plant. Maybe you wanna go out there and mark it all out. There are actually websites that you can go in there and actually help you. Really, where should I actually plant these uh, to try to get my the best uh, sunlight and nutrition for those particular plants? Japanese beetle, one of my favorite things in the entire world. Uh, and uh, so, I showed it to you in the beginning, one of those uh, Japanese beetles in the, one of the first slides here had that white dot on it. And I don't know if anybody here uh, has seen the white dots on those Japanese beetles. So whatever you do, do not, when you're out there picking those Japanese beetles, whatever you do, do not please pick those Japanese beetles that's got the white dot on there. So this right here is, um, maybe I go to the next slide. We get to recognize, you know, that particular dot on there. Uh, and the bottom one, by the way, it looks like it's a terrible, terrible pest, of course, but it is not. Uh, it is the ladybird beetle, I believe it is. Uh, and that one is eating an insect. But um, we want to minimize our insecticidal use. So we want to protect these beneficial in insects. And of course, we use spot treatments when we can. But uh, what is that white dot on that? Well, it's from the tachinid fly. And which fortunately here in the state of Maine has the exact same uh, life cycle as the Japanese beetle. When you see them, uh, that particular dot is an egg. That white dot is an egg. It's going to actually burrow into that Japanese beetle. It's going to convince that Japanese beetle to bury into the ground right then. And it, the beetle will die but that uh, egg will pupate and it will stay in the ground and then it will come back up and it will do it again next year. So, uh, and they're truly, truly easy to see. So when I go out there, I have grapes and I'm, I'm picking my Japanese beetles off there and swearing I should be using more chemicals. Um, do not pick the ones that have the white dots on them because uh, we want to save them. So going back to that trap, you know, that trap, uh, actually is attracting males, right? So it's, it's a pheromone and it's attracting, but it attracts so many, you know, it's going to bring them from a long ways away. So I always used to joke, uh, you know, if you don't like your neighbor, be more than happy to please give them a few Japanese beetle traps and send them down there because really you want those Japanese beetles, all of them to stay away from your property. So they, they will attract males, but really they are so many males uh, and there's so many, but they're still going to be bringing them to your property. So my recommendation and the Board of Pests says we always recommend, please do not use them. Hopefully that answered that, <laughs> that question. They yes, really perfect. Thank you. Help, uh, but, you know, you see hundreds of them in your trap and you think, oh, what a great job I'm doing. But the reality is they're, they're just the males. There are a lot more females out there. And so uh, we prefer other ways to use it. And that is, again, maybe you're using... Uh, shrubs and trees that you you know that uh, you stay away from them that the Japanese beetles like so much and again we can cover uh, plants that we really want to protect for example grapes is another one uh, and again use trap plants like the Virginia creepers in here pole beans stuff like that actually so that the Japanese beetle can actually go to that and not be feeding on the things that you really want it to which a lot of which we do do we try to bring them to something else Use site appropriate non-invasive plants. You're gonna probably hear this all the time from now on. Native plants are well, far more adaptive, fewer problems, less work, more rewards, but they're not all of course problem free like viburnums. Invasive plants are easy to grow, but crowd out native vegetation. Um, our local forest habitats are changing rapidly and, and it's in the news constantly. There's so much going on with invasives fortunately. Uh, they can really ruin our wildlife habitat. And then uh, I don't know how many of you have invasive bittersweet, but if you have that, in, uh, I mean, the or oriental bittersweet too, um, you know, they are just can really overtake places. So again, we're really trying to push to stay away from invasives and take care of them. Again, going back to that right plant, right place, the right purpose. Uh, I'm the last one to give you advice on this, but really do want to do your homework before you grab those plants. Uh, are, is your site, can it handle that particular plant? All right, are the conditions, are the, do you have enough sun? Do you have the right soils? Uh, do you have enough water? 
select plants that thrive under existing conditions rather than trying to alter the conditions to meet the needs of a plant. Uh, many, many people make this mistake. And again, you know, many of us already have some beautiful uh, landscaping plants that are already growing. Maybe we can actually try to uh, use them in our landscapes. Use a diversity of plants and grasses. They're less notable damage from pest and disease. If you have a wide, wide diversity of plants, you may not even know that you've got a, a plant being attacked. Uh, incorporate many layers of plants types like trees and shrubs and ground covers, perennials and lawns. So the key word today is diversity. The more we have diversity, the more the better off we're going to be. We may not even know that we have a pest problem. Oops. Create a wildlife habitats. Diversity and plant layers go hand in hand with habitat creations add nectar and fruit producing plants, strive for continuous blooms, add water walls, feeders and woody debris. Of course, that bottom picture is a wonderful thing. Of course, what does it also do? It attracts rodents, ticks and mosquitoes. So we have to be very careful how much we do and make sure that we continue to monitor it. We wanna enhance our habitat for beneficials. Many beneficials require pollen or nectar as dietary supplements, provide a series of plants that collectively provide continuous bloom, and many plants benefit natural enemies and pollinators. And two beautiful plants. And we proceed with caution to protect our beneficial insects. So again, I, I stress this, you know, there, if we're gonna use a pesticide and we have to be very careful about that, there are different types of pesticides and one is called the broad spectrum, which can actually, instead of being more target of a certain insect, it may actually be very broad spectrum. It may kill many of these things such as our dragonflies, our parasitic wasp and, uh, and, and all of these other types of bugs. So we have to be very, very careful. We don't want to actually kill the good insects. John, speaking of that, somebody had asked, well, we're getting a lot of questions about aphids, um, but somebody had asked, how can we get rid of aphids on milkweed without killing caterpillars? So, um, I mean, I got to think about that <laughs> for a minute. And, and uh, that, is, that is a very challenging thing. One, because aphids, where do they grow? You know, they're underneath the leaf usually. So it's very difficult to get to that. But I, I may actually reach out to another person, I'll write myself a note here and, and get that, Julie, get that answer back to you. Um, sure. Because it is very challenging to spray for aphids, but there are other, there are um, a lot of beneficial insects that obviously feed on aphids, such as whether it be uh, the late ladybugs and things like that. So let me get a better answer for you before I say that. That's All okay. right, thank you. I'm showing you my weakness. I get a little nervous about giving sometimes answers here so, without making sure I research, <laughs> research. No, no, it's fine. This has been so much great information so far. Please continue. Uh, spiders, one of my favorite things. You know, some people get a little nervous, but they are big predators of insects. Whatever we do, let's save those spiders out there. And this is a great slide from Michigan State University. Truly uh, one of the best slides there is. Shows you what you you know what these particular plants when they bloom so we can have that continuous bloom for our pollinators and beneficials uh, and how good they are you know and so on so please you can take this really it's a great great slide gives you you can be planting these to have blooms all year round but also what you're really doing is helping our bees pollinators and beneficials so i always bring this up and and I, you know time is pretty short here but again you know, uh, I used to ask this question a lot of these beautiful, beautiful plants or are they pests? So uh, I'm sure many of you have seen these, but of course that purple loose stripe is up on the upper left. We don't want that. It's taken over our fields. That one on the right, one of my favorites when I was in college, I couldn't wait to have a home so I could put this particular plant in here. And now I'm, when, when you can't plant, you can't buy it here in the state of Maine. We still see it everywhere. And that, of course that's the burning bush. Uh, and then on the bottom here, we have a Japanese barberry. If you do have Japanese barberry uh, in your property, you have one other thing for sure, and that is an abundance of ticks. And then, of course, the oriental bittersweet. None of those 
are beneficials, are good. They're all real pests. Also, um, birds, they are a huge ally. This is a great book. I don't know if anybody's used it. Um, I'm sure that I'm gonna get Julia to have this in the library, but this really is a great book to find out about um, how native plants sustain wildlife in our gardens. And one of the things I just wanna point out is that when you look at this particular graph, the native plants actually supply 12 times more Lepidopteran species, which is a wonderful, wonderful food source for our birds uh, here in the spring and summer. So again, we also like to, I like to do this stress, you know, reducing your lawn, you know, planting more of those perennials and flowers and so on. Uh, it certainly reduces our water and air pollution, our water usage, our maintenance and cost. And it gives me a heck of a lot more free time, um, I'd like to think. So plant diseases, always select resistant varieties. So at the good site, is, how is that water drainage? Is it sandy? Is it gravelly? Uh, is it a good soil, full sun, air movement? Maintain really good plant spacing. Mulch prevents a uh, rain splash of soil borne diseases. Again, we want that mulch around this. Rogue out disease plants. I, I, you know, always be hearing this. If you've got something you see that has got, whether it be a disease or so on, get rid of it uh, and get rid of it as soon as you can. And just don't, you know, either burn it, don't put it in your mulch pile. You gotta either, you know, somehow truly, truly get rid of it. And again, don't put it in your mulch pile. Ensure plants get the right amount of sun, water, and nutrition. Make sure you always are researching what that plant needs. Does it need full sun or does it need shade? We use low impact varieties that, that no mow fescue grass taking off, the Kentucky bluegrass. Choose a dogwood versus a flowering cherry. Why do we want to do that? Well, you know, cherry brings in a lot of fall webworms and a lot of other insects. So maybe that dogwood would be a better choice for you. And then river birch versus paper birch. Paper birch, beautiful, beautiful tree, but it is really subjected to a lot of different diseases, a lot of different insects, where the river birch is not. And of course, paper birch really doesn't like to be out there all by itself uh, and so on. But again, you have many choices to choose a different variety. Protect our lakes and streams with buffers. Preserve that existing landscape. We want winding paths. Don't mow down to the water's edge. Leave the duff. As you can see, the upper right-hand corner has something that's kind of neat, like a, and it's a rain barrier, you know? So we use these particular rain barriers to reduce the amount of um, water that's going down that could actually go into our groundwater, our, our surface waters. Uh, we want to direct water into vegetative areas instead of running it off. Irrigate properly and only when needed. So extremely important. I'll have a slide here in just a second about that. Um, grow plants that are uh, really resistant to insects and disease. White fir is a very common uh, conifer. Uh, that you're using today versus balsam fir, which is, has a lot of disease issues and insect issues. And we wanna use plants that, are, that to tolerate low fertility and a drought resistance. And one of the best ones is sweet fern. It's a great plant to have. You can use teas on it, smells really good. All kinds of different products can be used from sweet fern. Wonderful, wonderful plant. Uh, where do you wanna learn more? Yardscaping. Uh, you can go to that particular website right there. Uh, it is excellent. It's got all kinds of different um, ideas for you to use in your garden. And uh, again, integrated pest management. Know your pest. Find out. Trap it. Go to the cooperative extension. We're going to talk about cultural practices, mechanical methods, and please use pesticides as the last resort. So again, I'm not going to waste any time on this, but is this a pest problem? Does anybody know that this is a pest problem? This was always a quiz I had to give people. So of course, this is the sori on the bottom of a uh, fern. Absolutely not. And the, how about the upper right? Is that? Well, no, because that's a tree you buy that was actually to look like that, the variegation maple. And this, of course, this is a serious problem, but not. It is actually all conifers and all uh, softwoods lose some of their needles in the, uh, in the fall. That's why we have to rake up underneath our pine trees. But again, 
That is definitely not a problem or a disease. What caused this? I enjoy, wish I could spend more time on this, but the person's property right there, his irrigation system was not working. Uh, and again, why do we find all the apples on the ground? Again, that's a pretty natural thing. Actually, actually, apple trees will lose a certain amount of apples to protect the other apples on their trees. So there's nothing wrong with this either. So let's talk about physical pest control methods, mulching. Um, it can suppress weeds, conserve moisture, provide habitat for natural enemies, pull mulch away from the trunk to decrease pest disease potential. I gave a talk one time uh, and had everybody get up and look out the window because in the facility that we were there, that's exactly how they took care of their trees. They built that mulch up way up high, which is the wrong way to do it. Sanitation, rake leaves to reduce disease. And that would include also you have apple trees. Make sure you get the actually the old apples that are on the ground, the rotten ones away from those trees, which can harbor, uh, harbor, harbor uh, insects that will go on next year. And again, remove and destroy disease plants. Don't put them in your mulch pond. Physical methods, we use screens, barriers, uh, bird netting and row covers, pruning infested infecting plants, Get those clippers out. You find something that's got disease on it, cankers on it, and so on. Get rid of them. Again, try to burn them, maybe pack them up, get some out of the way, but please don't save them, put them in the mulch pile because they're just going to come back. Paper and straw mulch. Um, suppress your weeds, provides habitat for natural enemies, and keeps soil from drying out. Really super important right here, as you, many of you may know. Uh, to put that mulch down uh, to protect and keep away those weeds. Julia, I know I'm running out of time. Did I keep going for a while? Uh, we have a number of questions. I, if it would be okay, we could start answering some of those. I want to make sure that you know we address a few of them, if that's okay. That would be great. Okay. Right. So the first one is, um, what is a method that you can recommend for properly washing fruits and vegetables in order to reduce pesticide exposure? So when they when you get it from the grocery store, I'm taking it. I'm I'm guessing that's what the person means. Yes. You know, um, what I understand is to actually use just water, but use water in, in a forceful way to to knock it off, because it, it would be just on the surface. But the key is to actually whatever you buy at the grocery store, when it comes to your fruits and vegetables, to definitely wash wash it and i would just personally i recommend water okay i mean we there are there are for example there are many uh harvesting places apples is one uh for example that do put their fruit uh, in a in a bath that does have uh, types of pesticidal products in it that actually to 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 keep the, obviously the pest away but also for storage but yes, water I, would be the definitely, in my recommendation, the best item to use, but a lot of it and, you know, very forceful. Um, do you have a recommended lab for water testing? You were talking about drift and runoff earlier. Do you have a recommended lab where folks could find out about water testing? So it, it really depends on what they are um, needing to testing for. So that's a great question. There, you know, you can, there are a lot of labs here in the state of Maine that will do testing for you, but they're not going to actually test uh, for a lot of the active chemicals, active ingredients that are used in pesticides. What we do uh, right now, we are the samples that we're collecting are actually going to a lab in Montana and they will be testing for, I believe, uh, four to 500 different active ingredients, what they're going to find in their water. It's expensive though. So it is $400 approximately for a sample. So we have to be very, there's also a lab uh, at Amherst in Massachusetts that we use to test for uh, chemicals in the water. The, the labs here that many people use here in this, you know, locally are not gonna be looking for all of those active ingredients. So the one that we use is the Montana lab primarily to, to test for pesticide in our products, in the water, excuse me. 
Uh, this question may be a bigger one than we have time to answer, but in a nutshell, or if you have this information at the tip of your fingers, um, do you know any pesticides that are specifically associated with Parkinson's disease? Rotenin, uh, the, you know, which is not marketing today, was dealing with, with Parkinson's disease. And that was my understanding that it was taken off the market because of that rotenin, yes. Okay. Um, I yes. don't know of any other, but I will, you know, I can ask the, our toxicologist um, uh, if there are other products and I certainly will let you know. Sure. Um, again, I want to mention that if we are not able to get to your question or if you would like a further follow-up, you can certainly reach out to uh, Mr. Petrosky. Um, yes. Beverly asks, fruit flies in raspberry bushes are a problem. Do you have any recommendations for managing fruit flies in raspberry bushes? Uh, possibly, but, but um, let me answer that and get back to you for sure on that one. Uh, you know, I, and I will, that's a great question. Uh, and there are, you know, that, that spotted wing Drosophila fly which is now you, we see a lot in our berries, in our, in our blueberries, especially here, uh, can be treated, but they are a challenge. So I would rather actually get, truly get that information and give them the right, I, what I can do, by the way, I can't say use Roundup, but I can say use this particular active ingredient and it might be by Fentherin or something like that. Um, so I, I will find out, I, the Board of Pesticides, we cannot endorse any particular. Uh, any sure. Product. Yeah, that makes sense. But I can tell you what active ingredients to use, so I will find that out as well. Um, Marty mentions that she uses a green company for tick control and that the company claims that um, the following in regards to their spray, that the product is 25B exempt, meaning it is exempt from EPA registration. Uh, yes. because of the benign nature. So do you have thoughts on these, these green tick control products that are being used? I, I do, uh, I do. And, and it is, the truth is buyer beware. So the first, the most important thing is uh, how often are they treating your property? You know, and what are they actually telling you? Unfortunately today, what we're seeing is, you know, people buy the super duper gold plan and they're gonna get a treatment every week, every two weeks. So whatever that particular plan is that they are paying for. I asked them, I would ask the person who's doing their, prove to me I still got ticks. You know, if you're saying it works so well. And because when you, when you look at 25B products, there is no research being done truly for the efficacy. You know, how well are they really working? So um, just it's going to be very careful. So you can do this. You can take an old towel, beach towel. You can take an old sheet and you can make it maybe four or five feet, you know, and then drag it around the areas that you think that the ticks are. So you can then uh, say, well, maybe I do have ticks or maybe I don't. As you know, sometimes and something that we're working on is that, you know, people sign up for a program and they get a, they get an application every week or every two weeks or something like that. And the question is, do, do they really, really need it? And there are many things that you can do with ticks because they're a serious problem. You know, where is your bird feeder? You know, where do you actually have it? Do you have it near where, uh, you know, your, your children are or your animals? Because if you do, birds bring in one heck of a lot of ticks. Do you keep your lawn mowed down? Do you keep, if you have woods around your home, do you keep that brush away from that? Because ticks aren't gonna be, you know, in the middle of your lawn. You know, they may be one or two, but they are not uh, really, that's not where they wanna live. They wanna live where it's got some shade. They wanna live in the duff, you know, usually right near your lawn, but, but in the woods. Um, and they got to get up high to get on you. You know, they can't jump. So they got to get somehow, you know, go up on some bush or some little plant to get on you. So there are many ways that we can actually control ticks before we actually use, we use chemicals. So, uh, but I am always very cautious about some of the things that we hear, what people are doing, uh, both commercial, you know, using commercial pesticide products on ticks, but also 25B products about how well they're working, but more, more importantly, 
you know what, do I really need it? How bad are the ticks there? Because ticks are a scary word, you know, nobody wants the ticks on us. And uh, so go out, grab an old beach towel, drag it around your property, turn it over. How many ticks have I got? You know, maybe you don't have very many. But again, look at the other ways to actually reduce where the ticks are. All right. I know that, you know, we have to wrap up. John's got another Zoom call at, at 11, so we want to give him a chance to have a break. But well, I what... can go longer. I don't, you know, let, let, uh, <laughs> whatever, whatever the people want. I, well, I we've got one last question. Um, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but maybe we can get some good news here. Will the really cold weather in the next week or so do anything to reduce the brown tail moth? That is a great question. And the answer is absolutely not. Uh, so, it is, um, it's not going to hurt them at all. <laughs> the only thing that, uh, you know, and living where you live, and, and now that I live in Liberty, um, and I, we live in the red zone, and they are certainly miserable, and they're the worst thing. So there are things that you can do right now uh, on your fruit trees, you know, because we know they like apples, I like pears and stuff like that. And if you look out the window of my home right now, you'll see that my apple trees that I have, crab apples and stuff like that. You can see the nest of the um, brown tail moth. Clip them. You know, you got to get up there. You get clip those. They're easy to get to right now. They're about the size of your fist. But in that little nest, which is pretty small, you know, there's anywhere from 50 to 400 really tiny caliper, uh, caterpillars that are going to cause you pain and misery uh, this summer. So you want to go out there and clip them. Uh, and then, so but what does, you know, the brown tail moth want that they really truly want, you know, oak trees. They want to be up high uh, and they are very challenged to get. So what we all have to pray for is uh, this spring, we want it to be cool and cold and we want it to be really, really wet. By doing that, there's a fungus that actually affects the brown tail moth uh, that actually, you know, will, will thrive in cold, damp, wet springs. And that will actually help knock it down, which uh, other than that, no. You know, I mean, you can use systemic pesticides, meaning you can see people bore into their oak trees and you can be, they'll be injecting a systemic in there and that will go up through the tree and then the uh, brown tail moth will eat the leaves and so on. Uh, but again, if you are doing it, but your neighbor across the street is not doing it, the brown tail moth are pretty smart when they do lay their eggs, they go somewhere where hopefully there are not a lot of other brown tail moths to inhabit that to give their young some chance to, to eat, so. With those um, injectable pesticides into the into the oak trees, um, someone did ask a question earlier talking about, they were advised that there's three days of toxicity and it's very dangerous for three days. Um, do you have any comments on that? So, you know, systemics are, uh, I believe are, uh, I shouldn't use the word safe, but less risk of chance of getting it harm on you. You know, you want to, you, you, they're right. You I mean, you put them in, they put them in, you want to keep people away from them for at least three days, if not longer. Uh, but again, they're going to go, that chemical is going to go down into the roots and then it is going to go actually up into the tree and it will go up, um, you know, into the leaves so that when the brown tail moth starts feeding, and, and by the way, it's coming up here in March and, and April, uh, maybe that's the latest part of it that you're going to be doing that because you do want to get it into the tree and get it up into when the leaves are budding. There are other issues with it. This is a side note. I mean, sometimes um, if you put in certain plants, they begin actually in a flower. And if the flower actually has a systemic in it, it could actually hurt beneficials and pollinators. So but we have to be a, a little bit careful about that. But, you know, systemics do work and they work well on that tree. But if you've got, as I said, you know, um, there's a lot of good research out there. They're a little expensive, but the, the point is, is that you live in a neighborhood. There are a lot of oak trees or maybe a lot of fruit trees in there. You know, you can do it on every one of your trees, but those tiny microscopic hairs, if your neighbors aren't doing it, and there's a tiny, tiny microscopic hairs, they float for miles, and uh, you know you still have a chance at uh, being affected by it. Jeffrey asks if the uh, dry leaves contain the poison also. 
Uh, so it's the actually it's this tiny microscopic hair. So on a brown tail moth, you know, uh, they have the orange dots on them, so you always can tell how they are. But the hairs that actually are toxic, they are very tiny. You can't see them. They have a barb on it like a fish hook. And what happens is, is that they are viable for the good news is three years. So you could have brown tail moth two years ago and those tiny hairs have floated down. They're in your wood pile, they're in your, in your leaves. When you rake it up, when you move it, those fibers can get on your skin, get into your skin and it's gonna cause you a, a really tough rash. So um, they are viable for three years. So for three years, yeah. It's, it, there's nothing good about the brown tail moth, I, you know. I, I think that Jeffrey's question, he meant the systemic. Does the systemic uh, remain in the dry leaves also? No. It, that's a great question. It, they, it will eventually break down. So by the, probably by the time they're dry, no, it will okay. break down uh, and not be viable. All right. But again, so it's going to depend on that active ingredient. Many, active, many of those products are different, but um, by then, you know, the best way to break down a pesticide is sun, uh, and the sun will actually usually break it down. Um, okay, we'll just do one last question. I know well, you I do. Oh, I got, don't worry. I, you know. No, it's okay. We, we don't, <laughs> we'll wrap up. Um, so someone was concerned about um, their neighbor sprays, and they wanted to know if they should get their well water um, checked because of the drift from their neighbor's spray. So, so that is, a fabulous question. So there's, there's two things I'd like to really point out on that. Um, if you have real concerns like that, and you know, you can contact the board of pesticides and say, you know, uh, I, you know, I'm concerned about where the person, the, my neighbor is spraying, you know, I'm concerned about where it's gone to, and you can um, uh, contact the board of pesticides. We can come down and take a sample. Uh, you know, for example, we would take a sample where the person spray, we would talk to them, you know, did they spray, for example, let's just say they were spraying poison ivy, and we could take a sample from that, but we'd also take a sample close to your, um, maybe your well or, or on your property, did, in the, and see if there was drift, it's, you know, we do that a lot, I know we are here, we have five inspectors around the state, and we can come in and actually help you and look at it. So that is very important. Never be afraid, you know, uh, to ask. It, it is your right. You know, you we, you do want you don't want pesticides, you know, in your well or on your property for sure. The second thing is that you can do, which is very very important. There are two notification registries here in the state of Maine. The first one is if you want to know what pesticides are being used by commercial people around you. And this would include like turf or it would, you know, somebody going and spraying the lawns or it would, con or, or would it be for people that are doing ticks and mosquitoes or, and things like that. It's commercial people doing this particular applications. You sign up with the registry on the board of pesticides. It's free. And anybody that sprays within 250 feet of your property has to let you know before they do the application. It works really well. Uh, unfortunately, you know, you can contact us right now, but you wouldn't get, the notifications wouldn't start until next year because of the way it works, the, the cycle. But, but it's still good to get on. It, it's a really good program. It's, it doesn't cost you anything. And all, pest, all commercial pesticide applicators, for example, you see the you know, signs on people's property that my lawn was sprayed. You would be notified if you was within 250 feet. Okay. Well, the can you, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say the second notification is, is from neighbor to neighbor. And you have every right to notify your neighbors within 500 feet of your property. And we have a letter that you would present to them. And they in turn have to let you know, hey, I'm going to be spraying my roses and I'm going to be using this particular product. So you would have the right to know what the product they, they're using, you know, you would be able to get the label and the EPA number and actually look at it for yourself. So this is self-notification. This is for everybody. If you've got farms, you know, or in anybody, you know, could be treating whatever it is. It is also a great program for people to use to find out if my neighbors are using pesticides and to find out what it is. And can you once more tell us how we can um, sign up to participate in that? 
So you want to go to uh, uh, the Board of Pesticide website, which is Think for a Spray Last. Um, and uh, say that I can give you guys another presentation, by the way. I'm just. I'm just <laughs> oh, yeah, the comment that came in and says we can benefit from a whole other hour with John, yeah. which is which is definitely well, true. You know, I, I'm very lucky and I really want to appreciate all that, you know, um, the opportunity to come speak. So again, it is the, you know, I think for a spray last, if you go to that, um, we will, you can get that information. If not, there is my cell phone number. You can always call me, um, you know, and, and I will get that information to you, whatever you need. Yes, thank you. This, this has been just such a wealth of information and I've been taking notes furiously the whole time. Um, folks, if we did not get to your question today, again, there's John's contact information right on the screen there. Um, and again, please visit uh, Think First, Spray Last. I know I am. It sounds like there's just a tremendous amount of resources there. Um, and once again, John, thank you so much for your time. This has been a very illuminating, um, illuminating program. A lot of things that I thought, you know, especially with the natural, you know, pesticides and stuff that were that they were safe. I, I need to rethink some of that. So, um, so thank you again for sharing. I, I too want to thank you, Julia, for the opportunity and Deborah for giving me, giving us the opportunity to talk to you. And I always end it, by the way, I want to tell you that you can trust me because I work for the government. Uh, <laughs> I say that very seriously. We are here to help you. The Board of Pesticides has a great staff, very knowledgeable people. If we do not get that answer, you know, or don't have it, and I don't like to shoot off the, if I don't have the answer, so I will get them back to you. And I, and, and I will send them to both Deborah and Julia, uh, the questions that I haven't got the answers for, so everybody can get them. Thank you. And once again, everyone, we've recorded this program. So if you'd like to watch it again to reference it, it will be available on the Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel. If you have any difficulty finding that, just send me an email and I will happily send you the link to it. Um, I'm going to let you go now, John. Thank you so Thank much you. and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. We hope you join us again soon. Bye-bye.